My name is Bill Fraunheim. I'm one of the cardiologists in town, and I would like to thank all you guys for coming out tonight. Uh, we got a great crowd. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting it together, and for Lauren for uh, helping out with uh, the cooking demonstration after my talk. You know, I knew the organizers do were doing a really good job of promoting this talk because I got a call last night from a friend of mine, Mark Stitt. He's like, I'm really tired of seeing your face. <laughs> it's been on television. It's been on, you know, I hear it on the radio. And I said, you think you're tired of seeing my face? I'm tired of seeing my face. I can't even log on to a computer here in the hospital without seeing my face because they put it on there and I've been looking at it all week. But anyhow, so uh, what we're going to do tonight is uh, I'm going to talk about heart healthy foods and kind of give you a state of the art uh, sense for that. And then Lauren is going to do a cooking demonstration showing how that might be applied. Um, you know, when you're talking about nutrition and you're talking about uh, cardiac health, I think it's important to kind of give your perspective because part of, the, part of the challenge is there's so many different schools of thought when it comes to nutrition. And one person says one thing and then somebody else says exactly the opposite. So my talk is based in, to a large extent on two nutrition gurus, the thinking of two nutrition gurus. And this is one. This guy's name is Walter Ouellette. And Walter Ouellette, um, just coincidentally, happens to be from Hart, Michigan. And he went to Michigan State, and then he went to the University of Michigan, and now he's been at Harvard for probably 30 years. He's the chairman of the Department of Nutrition, and Harvard has probably put out more good nutrition research than any other center in the world. He's one of the five most cited authors on nutrition. He's published hundreds of papers. So a lot of this is the, um, is, is the Harvard kind of school of thought. Now, the second nutrition guru that I'm depending on is Katie Fraunheim. Katie, she's 16 years old. She goes to West Ottawa, also a very prestigious high school. She's been a vegetarian since she was 10 years old. And she is a big proponent of the health benefits of eating snow. <laughs> zero calories, zero fat, and very nutritious. And she, she's here, actually, right here in the first row. And she's going to be happy to entertain any questions after the talk <laughs> on snow. All right, well, just how important is diet when it comes to heart health? Now, this, is, this is a recent study, and I'm going to try and be talking about I'm going to reference a few recent studies, but hopefully in a way that makes sense to everybody. You know, there are 610,000 people that died of heart disease in this country. That's one in four of all deaths. More people die from heart disease than all forms of cancer combined. So it's a, obviously the, it's, it's a huge problem. And of those 600,000, 400,000 die from, of those deaths can be attributed in part to diet, which is amazing when you think of it. I mean, that's, that's two thirds of deaths. And if you throw in lifestyle, exercise, stress management, 80% of cardiovascular deaths are preventable through good lifestyle management. Um, this is 2017, so how did we get here? I mean, we just sent we just sent this rocket with a Tesla on it to the Mars orbit, but we're still trying to figure out how to eat right. Well, how did we get here? We got here on the, on the heels of some very bad dietary advice. All right, now I don't know how many of you, of you guys remember the USDA guidelines from way back when. This is the seven basic food groups. Anybody remember the seven basic food groups? A couple people. I mean, one of these food groups is butter. Another one is milk. One's potatoes. And it's, you know, this is, this is kind of the, what we thought for many years. Now, this is the one I grew up with, the four basic food groups. All right, fruits and vegetables are in one corner. Dairy, this includes ice cream, is in a corner. And over here is bread. All right, so... 
you know, that's what a lot of us ate for many, many years. But the one that probably kind of did the country in more, did more damage than any was this food pyramid, which was the USDA's recommendation on what to eat from 1992 until 2005. And basically the recommendation, the thought was that, that fat is bad. You know, we've got to get rid of all the fat in the diet. And so they put fat way up here in the tip of the pyramid, which means eat less of it. You eat the most of this and the least of this. So they said, get rid of all fat. And the foundation for the USDA was carbohydrates. So this is cereal, grains, bread, crackers. And on this low-fat diet, what we saw was the population get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this line, this line is obesity and how it's changed over the years in the country. And the blue line is how the carbohydrate intake has changed over the years in the country. And you can see as our carbohydrate intake went up and our, our, sat, our fat intake went down, the country got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're the most overweight developed country in the world. 35% of Americans are obese and 65% are overweight. So it's, it's a major, major problem. And what, what happened is here, you know, we took these, these fats and we got rid of them and we re-engineered food. And we created these like low fat, low cholesterol health foods. And so foods like Twinkies, you know, have the heart, kind of the heart health symbol on them. And we just started eating more and more Twinkies <laughs> and other foods like them. And it, it's, it's not just... It, it, I mean, a lot of it is, is carbohydrates, but there's also sugar, refined grains, and a lot of other bad things in there. So to, as we, we've recognized the error of our ways, and now this has spurred like this ton of research. You know, we have this epidemic of obesity, and now we're being bombarded by nutrition studies. Every study here has been published in the last year, and some of these studies in the, fir in the last couple of weeks, some from 2018. And so it's hard to make sense of it. You know, some people say one thing, some people say something else. So how do you, you know, what do you eat? Okay, what do you eat and what don't you eat? And that's what we're going to be talking about now. So if we just go back to this slide, this is the, the 400,000 deaths from diet, heart related, heart deaths related to diet. They actually were able to do more than just tell us the number. They were able to tell us which dietary factors caused the problem. And so that's here. The biggest factors related to these heart deaths were a deficiency of nuts and seeds. That was one of the main ones. 9% of cardiovascular deaths were related to a deficiency of nuts and seeds. There was a deficiency of fruits and vegetables and a deficiency of whole grains in our diet. Also playing a role were low omega-3 fatty acids, excess saturated fats, excess processed meat, and sugary beverages. So that's the problem. I mean, we could almost stop right now and just say, eat more of the good stuff and eat less of the bad stuff, and that, but that's what we're gonna go into a little bit more. And that's my diet right here. My diet is the eat more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff diet. And it's really that simple. This is the good stuff, eat more of this, this is the bad stuff. You know, we talked about carbohydrates, saturated fats, protein, unsaturated fats, you know, and that kind of talk is very confusing. When we give dietary recommendations and we tell you to eat this much, you know, of this nutrient and less, it, people, it doesn't make sense. We can get there just as well just focusing on what to eat and what not to eat. So let's talk about that a little bit more. We need to eat less sugar sweetened beverages, but that's sugar. We need to eat less sugar. We, um, sugar is the biggest source of calories in the diet, 16%. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's should, you know, it's corn syrup. It's high, fruc it's high fructose corn syrup, um, sucrose. It's worse than just calories because it causes diabetes and metabolic issues. And it just causes a lot of bad things to happen. And this is how much sugar we eat. So in one week, you eat almost a shovel, the average American, full of sugar. In a year, a wheelbarrow. 
and in a lifetime, 3,550 pounds of sugar. This is, and this is added sugar. This is you know, added sugar to our food. And where does it come from? Well, it's sugar-sweetened beverages, pop. Okay, 35% of the daily sugar, of our added sugar, comes from pop. They're telling us now as cardiologists, we should ask our patients three questions. We should ask about smoking, we should ask about alcohol, and we should ask about pop. Because one pop per day increases your risk of heart disease 20%. So if you're gonna do one thing, one thing that's good for you, your heart, do not drink pop, ever. Um, okay, so sugar is also in grain, in other things, grain-based desserts, but the reason I wanted to put these other things in here is to highlight the fruit juice, because 10.5% of the added sugar in our diet is in fruit juice. Many people think that fruit juice is healthy. You should just drink it, and a lot of it. Well, we get more sugar, almost twice as much, in fruit juice than we do in, from candy. You know, it's all labeled 100% pure juice. I mean, this, is, you know, this isn't fruit punch, this is juice. There is as much sugar, nine teaspoons, in a glass of orange juice as there is in a Coke. So think about that. Katie, my, my nutrition guru, number two, she, I, I eat too much sugar. I mean, there's no doubt. I'm constantly trying to get rid of sugar in my diet, but sometimes I'm doing it by accident. See, I used to think that raisin bran was good for me. I mean, it's a whole grain and it's raisins. And so I'd eat a bowl of raisin bran and I'd add some sugar to it, you know, like a teaspoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't realize until I really started, and, and she's like, you can't do that. It's a sugar cereal. And sure enough, when you look at raisin bran, there is, there's almost five teaspoons of sugar in every bowl of raisin, of raisin bran. It's not just in the raisins. There's corn syrup and all this crap in the, in the actual whole grain, too. So you have to be careful. You know, it's there, and you might, not be, you might be getting it not even knowing it. So I switched to frosted mini weeks. There's less. <laughs> there, there's less sugar in frosted mini wheats than there is in raisin bran, and I don't have to add any. I don't eat that. I eat oatmeal a lot. Anyhow, so we have to eat something, okay, other than all this sugar, all right? So if we stop eating sugar, what are you going to eat? So this, you eat the good stuff, which is down here, and you don't eat the bad stuff, which is up here. So this is the risk of dying over five years if you substitute certain foods for sugar. All right, so if you stop eating sugar, but you eat meat and dairy instead, you're worse off. Your chance of dying is gonna go up six or 7%. So it, it's saturated fat seems to be one of the key problems with meat and dairy. Whereas if you substitute for all that sugar, the nuts, fruits and veggies that we're going to talk about here in the last 15 minutes, you're getting mono and polyunsaturated fats. So if you, this is kind of a Mediterranean type diet, all right? If you switch from sugar to a Mediterranean type diet, your risk of dying from heart disease goes down about 30%, which is the same as taking a statin. So I know there's a lot of people on statins in this room. You can get the same benefit or additional benefit just from improving your diet. But like I said, I mean, it, so when we talk about the good stuff and the bad stuff, we're talking about saturated fats and unsaturated fats, but we're just, I'm just trying to do it in a way that makes more sense. Okay, so we're gonna eat less sugar-sweetened beverages and less sugar, and we're gonna eat less meat. Okay, especially processed meat. Meat, was the number two thing if we were to look at the things that cause heart disease, causing about nine, eight, eight percent, eight, nine percent of the heart attacks. Part of the problem is it's got tons of sat fat, okay? There's 15 percent of the sat saturated fats in the diet are in meat. 
And this, these are the kind of numbers you see out there, you know, and it's pretty alarming. For every three ounce serving of unprocessed meat you take in, your risk of dying from cardiovascular disease goes up 13%, and your risk of dying from cancer goes up 10%. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, those are big numbers, but let's say your risk of dying, it's not quite as dramatic as it sounds, maybe your risk of dying from cancer is 10%. If you eat a lot of meat, it goes up to 11%. But the fact is there, is, there is an association between red meat and heart disease and red meat and cancer. But you're not going to get that from the USDA. They're paying for the Cattlemen's Association. You know, it's, you know, there's too many conflicts of interest. There's also an increased risk of diabetes. No one will tell you how much meat to eat in a week because, actually, people don't agree on it. That's part of the problem. The American... Institute for Cancer Research, not the, not the American uh, Heart Association, they say you should eat less than 18 ounces of red meat per week just to lower your risk of cancer. So that's from the American Institute of Cancer Research. I've heard other people say, you know, uh, less, but it's not official in guidelines from the USDA or, or anywhere else that I could find. Less meat can help the environment too. Katie's big, big on this. So if you're a vegetarian, you generate as much pollution, this is kind of cool, I thought, as driving 629 kilometers over the course of a year. Okay, this, they, they kind of, they correlate the environmental impact of being a vegetarian and a meat eater, and they do it in, in terms of how many miles it would be. So if you're vegan, it's the equivalent of driving 629 kilometers a year. If you're a vegetarian, it's the equivalent of driving 2,400 kilometers a year. You're generating that much pollution. But if you're a meat eater, it's the equivalent of driving 4,700 kilometers per year in a BMW. I add that down there. So there, there's a, I mean, this was also interesting. In, in the San Joaquin Valley, cows cause more pollution than cars. And this is the dirtiest place in the country. And this was in 2005 in, in the Los Angeles Times. They said cows pass cars. It's the biggest source of, the, of pollution in the dirtiest city in the country. So there is an environment, environmental impact if you want to go from that angle. Eat less dairy. All right, dairy, greater than 30% of the saturated fat in the diet. Three, so people just go low fat, just go low fat. Well. In 2017, I don't, this, this is, you know, these studies you take for granted because they're kind of, I think they generate hypotheses sometimes. But this study that just came out that got a lot of press, I don't know if anybody saw it, says that if you eat three or more servings of low-fat dairy per day, your risk of developing Parkinson's disease goes up. This guy, Walter Willett, he, he is not big on dairy. He says, limit dairy to low fat, one serving every one to three days. Now, that's less than you're going to see most other places. But this is where there's just lots of different schools of thought. But I think, in general, we need to limit dairy. Now, I'm, I'm also guilty of this because I like ice cream. And this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. But my wife went to a fundraiser. And she won four half gallons of Hudsonville ice cream a month for a year. And you got to go there and pick out your favorite flavors every month. And this was my cholesterol before I ate a year's worth of ice cream. And this is my cholesterol after I ate a year's worth of ice cream. My LDL went from 127 to 163. That's like a 30% increase. So I've cut way back on my ice cream. Almost never. <laughs> okay, uh, so nuts and seeds. This was eat more nuts and seeds. This is, I don't know, this is not a part of everyone's, uh, you know, of a lot of our diets. This article just came out, I think this, this was in November, and one of our major cardiology journals, okay, the American College of Cardiology, they said that if you eat a handful of nuts, these are tree nuts and peanuts, a handful of nuts five days a week, your risk of dying from heart 
disease goes down 20%. You also have a low risk of stroke and cancer in some studies, and not to have a lot of fat, but you don't gain weight. They, they are so filling that in these studies, people did not gain weight. They say, you know, raw nuts, they're filled, they're seeds, they're filled with nutrients. They say you should think of raw nuts as like natural health capsules. They're like taking, you know, they're like supplements. And so um, I guess if, if you were going to pick one nut, okay, so this is, this is across the board, but the one nut that I think has probably been shown to be the very best is a walnut. So walnuts that are unprocessed. You can't process them because then you take, you know, the good stuff away. We got to eat more omega-3. This is omega-3 fatty acids are these polyunsaturated. This is the lowest line on my graph, which means the greatest benefit uh, in terms of a food group. So these are essential fatty acids. Your body cannot make these. Okay, these have to come from food. They do a lot of good things in the body. And they come from three kind of main sources. There's marine omega-3s, so this is salmon and other fish. There's plant omega-3s. These come from nuts, green leafy vegetables, uh, another good source of omega, omega uh, in some grains uh, of omega-3s. And the third is some of these vegetable oils. All right, now, vegetable oils are, are many of them are very healthy, but you've got to be careful which ones you use. This is in the, uh, a presidential advisory, this table that the American, Heart Association, the American Heart Association submitted in 2017. It was an, a presidential advisory on, sat, on fat, good fat, bad fat. It's kind of important to realize that some fat, some um, oils have a lot of saturated fat, which is not necessarily good. And the, kind of the leader of the pack here is coconut oil. Coconut oil and palm kernel oil. When you look at butter, it has 63% of the fat is saturated. Coconut oil, 82% of the fat is saturated. So saturated fat, you know, it's, nothing is as easy. It's not animal saturated fat. It's not quite the same as plant saturated fat. But Walter Willett, the guy that, uh, again, who's kind of, you know, one of my gurus, says coconut oil, it's good on the body. It's not good in the body. And you let them figure it out for sure later on. But, you know, there's a look at all the other great oils. So, you know, olive oil, um, canola oil, you know, the, the oils that are readily available that are low in, if they're low in saturated fat, this is per, that means they're high in the other good fats. All right, uh, eat more fruits and veggies. Fruits and veggies, uh, you know, I think this kind of goes without saying. They do a lot of good things. But I wanted to show this next slide because this to me was fascinating. This is an article from a couple of weeks ago. It's like, what's the mechanism? How are fruits and veggies doing so much good stuff for us? So what they're saying is, some, one current mechanism is that all this fiber, fiber in this fruits and veggies is not absorbed by the gut. It actually feeds the bacteria in the gut. It makes them healthy. When the bacteria in the gut are healthy, they secrete mucus and that protects your intestine. So all this fiber is protecting your intestine by secreting this big mucus layer. If you're not eating a lot of fiber, that mucus layer goes away and you get all this inflammation. The bacteria now are, are in contact with the, with the actual intestinal lining and it causes all kinds of inflammation. They're, they're saying a lack of fiber from fruits and veggies causes inflammation in the gut and inflammation causes heart disease. So it's just, I think, very interesting to see how some of these things might, you know, come together. And, you know, we're, we're learning, like I said, I mean, we're learning stuff constantly. All right, eat more whole grains. This is a whole grain. A whole grain is three components. A whole grain is a seed. It's a seed from, a, from grass. The good stuff is the germ. Okay, it's nutrient packed. It's got all the a lot of good stuff and the bran, because that's the the outer layer that has all the fiber. The not so good stuff is the middle. A refined grain is the middle, and a whole grain is this. So what we do sometimes is we we refine we 
refine it, and we put to, turn this into white bread, white rice, and we serve it to us, and we take the leftovers and we serve it to cattle, the good stuff. And so it's kind of backwards. So more whole grains. It wasn't on my slide of, of substituting for sugar, but if you substitute whole grains for added sugar, your risk of heart disease is going down too. It's about 15% lower risk over five years. So just a couple more slides. I threw this in. This is not the eat. This, this is coffee because coffee, everyone's talking about coffee. And we've been trying to link coffee with heart disease for the whole time I've been a cardiologist, which is, or a doctor, which was, is since 1985. We've never done it. And now it's the opposite. Now we think that coffee actually protects against heart disease. So if you drink, this is your, your risk. This is your risk of heart disease if you drink this much coffee. It goes down 12%. One is no coffee. It goes down 12% if you drink a cup a day. It goes down 18% for three cups or four or more, three or more cups of coffee. And now the, the list of things coffee does that's good is long, long. It's much more than just heart. Maybe a lower risk of Alzheimer's, a lower, a better mentation, better performance. So I like coffee, but I, I put sugar in my coffee. <laughs> and sometimes cream. <laughs> but fortunately, I have Katie there to keep that, keep that low. But you know, a, a, a fruit juice has, what did I say? Five tablespoons of, or teaspoons of sugar in it. You know, I might put one teaspoon of sugar in this cup of coffee, or two. Uh, okay, so we're gonna finish up. So, you know, if you want, you can, you can eat more of the good, eat more of the bad, but there are diets that can help you do the same thing. This is USA, um, US News and World Report. These are in 2018. This just came out a few weeks ago. These are the best diets, okay? And they, there were scientists that picked these diets. I, they, they did a good job of picking these diets. The number one diet in the, out of all the diets they checked, which was over 40 diets, it's a tie. The DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet. So if you want to go follow a diet, you know, those, those are number one. And they all are doing what we just talked about. They're eating more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. They're plant-based diets. Uh, number three was the flexitarian diet and on and on. But I don't like to think diet. Uh, this is my last slide. I don't like to think diet. I just like to think, I mean, just, you know, just eat healthy. And so this is Harvard's healthy eating plate, all right? And you can get this and all the other information that I talked about at their website, which is the nutritionsource.org, nutritionsource.org. And this, they will just tell you, this is what you should eat, and this is the proportions that you should eat it in. And that's kind of a nice summary of what we've been talking about so far. So I'm going to leave it at that and turn it over to Lauren, who is a registered dietitian and is going to demonstrate how to apply these concepts to real life. And then we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you. Second one? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah. I got a thumbs up back there. All right. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm a registered dietitian here at the hospital. And I'm going to present to you today a chocolate avocado chia pudding. We have some samples in the back there if you haven't tried it yet. So I'm just going to really walk you through the recipe in case you've never dealt with an avocado, used chia seeds, and um, we'll both answer questions at the end. All right, so, oh, perfect. Here is the recipe up on top. We're going to start with the avocado. Um, the way to tell if an avocado is ripe or not, you should hold it and it should be slightly firm, but the part here um, where it's attached to the vine should just fall off just ever so slightly. So if it's falling off in the grocery store, by the time you get it home, it's gonna be nice and brown and overripe. If you struggle to get it off at home, then it's probably not quite ripe yet. Um, cutting an avocado, you're just gonna cut all the way around. happy day when an avocado looks like that. 
um, this recipe, just take a spoon, you're gonna scoop two in there. To get the pit out, carefully, use your knife, press it against the pit, and just give it a little twist and it should come right out. And then you can take the other pit, or the other side that you haven't used, and pull it off and you don't get your hands dirty. If you guys aren't using avocado for this recipe, you can slice it like this. This one's a little bit extra, right? And take your scoop out. And then you have some nice slices. This one didn't do it as nice as I would like. Moving on. All right. So this recipe calls for two avocados. Um, Avocados are filled with monounsaturated fats, high in potassium. Um, these monounsaturated fats are great for lowering your LDL cholesterol or that lousy cholesterol. Um, last one. And then there, I also mentioned that they're also high in potassium, which can help with hypertension. All right, next one on this is uh, unsweetened almond milk. Here I have a half a cup. I'm just gonna pour that in. Oh, the cocoa powder. We got our cocoa powder in. A quarter cup of plain non-fat Greek yogurt. Have you guys tried Greek yogurt over regular yogurt yet? So Greek yogurt is higher in protein, so it's gonna help sustain you a little bit longer than a regular yogurt would. Could have brought a rag up. Um, and then dates. Here we have three dates. These are going to be our natural sweeteners for this um, pudding recipe. So these dates are pitted. You can buy them with or without pits in the grocery store. I picked mine up at Family Fair. This is where they come in. Um, so make sure that you take the pits out because we don't want those for this recipe. But they add the natural sweetness for our pudding. Um, I actually found this pudding in my cupboard. It expired in 2015, so I've been carrying it around for some time. But the first ingredient in pudding is sugar. Um, a couple ingredients down is partially hydrogenated soybean oil, which translates to a trans fat. On this recipe, um, it notes that there's zero grams of trans fats. So the nutrition label can get away with not requiring to label trans fat if it's under 0.5 grams. So there's a so you gotta read the nutrition labels and your ingredients what's in them. So don't take them 100% for face value. Make sure you're reading through your list of ingredients. But if the first ingredient's sugar in something, then maybe we could find a substitute. All right, where are we at? We got vanilla. So I measured this out ahead of time. And then chia seeds. Raise your hand if you've tried chia seeds yet. Ooh, that's quite a bit. Okay, perfect. So when my daughter was little, she's six now, we would take chia seeds and sprinkle them in yogurt, sprinkle them in oatmeal, smoothies, um, and for the longest time she called them sprinkles, and I didn't correct her, so, <laughs> but they look like it. So chia seeds, um, great source of omega-3. So if you're working on adding omega-3 to your diet, excellent source there. Um, and then that is it for the recipe. I'm gonna not subject you guys to blending this, but you blend it up until you get this nice creamy texture um, put it in the refrigerator for an hour so those chia seeds can start absorbing some of the liquid and they'll expand. They're going to do the same thing in your GI system. So they're going to expand and act as a good fiber source to help on their way out. And then once you have let them chill for an hour, you can sprinkle them. Your recipe here is sprinkled with almonds. Um, I sprinkled mine with the walnuts. So an unsalted nut to top it off. And then enjoy. Has anybody tried it? And what'd you think? Oh, you got a thumbs up. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, and then Lisa has uh, recipe cards and samples. So if you guys didn't get a chance to try them, she will happily pass one around to you.